All right, so uh, welcome to the African History Network show. It is Tuesday, February 1st, 2022, and we are live. There is a continued attack um, on critical race theory and this really false attack on what's being taught in schools, um, teachings about the history of slavery, teachings about the civil rights movement, different things like this. This continues, especially in Texas. Now, since 2021, 14 states have imposed uh, uh, restrictions through legislation, executive actions, or commissions, or commission votes, uh, and analysis from Education Week found. What we are seeing, and there's a good article from uh, Axios.com dealing with this, uh, that came out today, I think it was. What we are seeing is that for this year, for African American History Month, Black History Month in schools, it is much tougher, is much harder than previously. And there is an attack on uh, Black History Month because of new rules that are limiting how teachers can teach history in school. Uh, we're going to talk about that on, on, on today's show. This will be one of the stories we deal with. Um, Axios.com has this piece. New rules are limit limiting how teachers can teach Black History Month. New rules are limiting how teachers can teach Black History Month. And we, we really see this fight going on in Texas also. Uh, we're seeing a continuation on uh, books being banned as well. Okay. Uh, there is um, NBC News has an article dealing with a list of uh, 50 books that um, some people want banned in Texas, school books. Uh, some people want banned in Texas, books being used in schools. So we'll talk about that story. Then um, I want to give an update on what took place with the HBCUs today. We know there were uh, 13 HBCUs that got bomb threats today. Okay, now so far, uh, nobody's been hurt. Okay, at least physically. Uh, more than 12, NBC News has a piece on this as well as uh, CNN. More than 12 HBCU campuses targeted in new round of bomb threats. Okay, more than 12 HBCU campuses targeted in new round of bomb threats. And I, I was watching the Rachel Maddow show today and they were talking about it actually pretty much all day today on MSNBC and the Black News Channel. They've been dealing with uh, these bomb threats at HBCUs. Okay, now this is on top of what happened on uh, Monday where you had um, bomb threats at, um, it was about uh, seven HBCUs uh, on Monday, at least six historically black colleges, including Howard University, Southern University, and a uh, and m College in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, received bomb threats on Monday. Okay, so you had at least six HBCUs on Monday. Um, today, you had 13 HBCUs that uh, received bomb threats. All right, so uh, the FBI is investigating in some of these cases, the ETF, uh, Department of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. And you have many people saying that these are acts of terrorism. OK, so we'll discuss this as well. Now, also, I want to give an update on the uh, dealing with the investigation into the deaths of uh, Lawrence Smith Fields and also Brenda Rawls in uh, Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut. You know, we talked about that here on this show when I was on Roland Martin Un Unfiltered um, last, I think, week before last. Uh, we got a chance to talk to Donnell Crossland, who is the attorney for the family of Lawrence Smith Fields. Um, he's also the attorney for the family of Brenda Rawls. Now, they, these are two African-American women who both died on the same day, December 12th, 2021. Now, there's no connection in the deaths. However, 
um, the deaths are being investigated by the same uh, police department. New York Times has a has a good article dealing with this. And uh, we see that the mayor of Bridgeport has uh, put out a statement on I think that was on Monday. But uh, New York Times has this piece here. Um, second, second black family says Bridgeport police didn't notify them of death. Two officers were suspended over their handling of the cases of Lauren Smith Fields and Brenda Lee Rawls, who died in Bridgeport, Connecticut on the same day, December 12th, uh, 2021. We'll deal with all this on the other side of the break. Let's to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotep. We'll be back in a few minutes. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995 and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008 and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, The Business of Beings, was released in December 2021 and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis's books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Tuesday, February 1st, 2022. It's uh, the first day of African-American History Month, Black History Month. This year's annual theme is Black Health and Wellness. You'll hear me, you'll hear me talking about this all month. Um, if you like this type of information, you support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have the information right on the homepage. Uh, so you can support us. We're here six days a week. So the substance keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Also register for the uh, online classes that I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Class number one of ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school, starts up Saturday. February 5th, 2022, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a 10-week online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Class is on sale, $80, regularly $130. Uh, you have full access to the class even, af even after the class is over with. You're going to get, as a bonus, 15 of uh, my lectures in, in a um, digital format as a bonus for registering for this class. So visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. Uh, I want to jump into this first story here dealing with the uh, attack on African-American history. We're going to go to clip one here in just a second, Shakita, from NBC News, Deadline White House. So I saw that now, you know, we've been talking about critical race theory here uh, since early 2021, the attack on uh, critical race theory, this false attack from the right wing, from the GOP. And critical race theory is not taught in K through 12 schools. But because of these laws being put in place and we see uh, in 2021, 14 states have imposed uh, restrictions, various types of restrictions. Uh, this is causing a problem when it comes to teaching uh, African-American history, especially especially during this month, African-American History Month. So this is a piece from Axios.com uh, from uh, today. New new rules are limit, limiting how teachers can teach Black History Month. New rules are limiting how teachers can teach Black History Month. 
So schools and universities are marking Black History Month starting today, February 1st. But this is the first time it will be celebrated under new restrictions on diversity education and uh, on diversity education imposed by some states. Okay, this is the first time it will be celebrated under new restrictions on diversity education imposed by some states. Now, the constraints uh, are under the guise of banning the teaching of critical race theory. They limit what some uh, what some state supported institutions can discuss about the nation's racial past. Educators embracing African American history have received death threats. Some educators embracing African American history have received death threats. Now, since 2021, 14 states have imposed such restrictions through legislation, executive actions, or commission votes, an education week analysis has found. In addition, 35 states have introduced bills or taken other steps to restrict teaching, quote unquote, critical race theory, a concept that focuses on the legacy of systemic racism. But critical race theory is a legal analysis and critical race theory is basically taught in law schools, graduate schools, and you can, it's also taught at the college level, but mainly in law schools and graduate schools, it is a legal analysis. Just teaching American history is not critical race theory. You have people on the left who really don't know what critical race theory is and say American history, critical race theory. No, it isn't. Critical, critical race theory is a legal analysis. And then you have most of the people on the right who have no clue what critical race theory is. And a lot of this is causing confusion. Critical race theory has been around for 40 years. It wasn't a problem in 2018, 2019. It was, it was Donald Trump that made this a lightning rod, which is why Trump was so dangerous and why I said in 2016 on this show that Trump had to be defeated. People thought it was just about one person versus another person and didn't understand history and didn't understand the consequences of a, of a demagogue like Donald Trump who had tens of millions of followers on social media and who was weaponizing white grievance. They didn't understand the consequences. I, obviously they never studied the civil war and reconstruction. Cause if you studied the civil war, civil war reconstruction in the Jim Crow era that followed reconstruction and the attacks on African-Americans and in the rewriting of the state constitutions to suppress the African-American vote and the terror and the terrorism that was inflicted upon African-Americans in the Southern States, then we would have stopped them. But, People wanted to do whatever they wanted to do. So, okay, whatever. All right. Tried to tell you. In addition, 35 states have introduced bills or taken other steps to restrict teaching critical race theory or limit how teachers can discuss racism and sexism. Now, elementary school teachers, administrators, and college professors have faced fines physical threats and fear of firing because of this organized push from the right organized push from the right. This didn't just fall out of the sky. This is, this is a well-financed finance push from the right to remove classroom discussions of systemic racism. And there was a, 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 a good article from NBC news that we talk about uh, often here on this show. And it deals with how, um, how uh, Donald Trump helped to uh, initiate this attack on critical race theory. And I got to find the uh, article. I talked about it yesterday on Brenda Hill show, uh, how Trump ignited the fight over critical race theory in schools. That's the name. Of, that's the name of the article. Uh, it's from May 10th. 2021 NBC News and I'm going to pull it up here uh because when you when you read this article then all this stuff starts um coming together this one right here this gives the background information 
This is from uh, May 10th, 2021. How Trump ignited how Trump ignited the fight over critical race theory in schools. Republican lawmakers across the country have proposed bills to ban critical race theory in K through 12 schools. Here's what that really means. And once again, this goes now. This is from May 10th, 2021. This goes back to the September 2020 uh, executive or a memo uh, that Trump did. The proposed policies mimic former President Donald Trump's September 2020 memo ordering the Office of Management and Budget to stop funding training on critical race theory for federal employees, calling it a propaganda effort, calling it a propaganda effort. All this stuff is going, it follows that memo that Trump did September, 2020. Then you, then we saw the tax on the 1619 project around the same time, September, 2020, Donald Trump condemned the 1619 project that was spearheaded by Nicole Hannah Jones, Pulitzer Prize, uh, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, and then educators uh, embraced this message and began utilizing the 1619 Project and looking for resources to teach a more holistic history of the country. Donald Trump, as president, rebuked the 1619 Project as a warped, distorted trail of American history. Both the September 2020 memo that Trump put out and this attack on the critical race theory uh, and this attack on the 1619 Project sparked the commission of the 1776 report that Donald Trump commissioned as president. And the 1776 report was meant to combat the contents of the 1619 Project. Now, luckily, when Joe Biden became president, he took that BS down off of, off of whitehouse.gov and Joe Biden disbanded the 1776 uh, commission. Now, the countrywide uprisings in the wake of George Floyd's death only fueled the matter with pundits debating the nation's fraught history of racism. Thus, although President Joe Biden reversed Donald Trump's initial ban in January, January of 2020. Uh, two, th sorry, January 2021, January 2021, when he took the oath, took the oath of office, January 20th, 2021, 14 days after the uh, attempted insurrection. But the seed of death had already been planted. The seed of death had already been planted by Trump. Go read this full article here, because I, I still still listen to people who don't understand this coordinated effort. How Trump ignited the fight over critical race theory in schools. Then you look at this uh, 16 page. You look at this 16 page expose that we talked about here before that gets deep into what's behind all of this. And th this is done by NBC News. Excellent piece of journalism. This is why journalism is so important. Critical race theory. See, I know we're coming up here on a break. Um, I'm going to let you hear this segment from Deadline White House when we come back. Th everybody needs to read this right here. Critical race theory battle invades school boards with help from conservative groups, with help from conservative groups. In towns nationwide, well-connected conservative activists and Fox News have ramped up the tension in fights over race and equity in schools. This is from June 15th, 2021. This gets deep into all this history to, to, to show what's behind the, this whole anti-critical race theory movement. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break. You listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me. and She's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress 
at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Follow the story Skeeter Hawk as attorney Ben Brooks rediscovers his Gullah Geechee heritage and finds romance along the Gullah Trail and the Sea Islands. Jilted by his fiancée who refused to marry him, Ben Brooks goes back home to Gullah country. There, the Gullah people come to call him Skeeter Hawk. While rediscovering his heritage, Skeeter Hawk unravels dark family secrets. A beautiful childhood friend, Bulla, becomes his guide as they travel the Gullah Trail from North Carolina to the Sea Islands in South Carolina in search of more answers. Ben Brooks falls in love with her and becomes torn between her and his former fiance who wants to rekindle their romance. He also deals with a premonition that one of his enemies is pursuing him, providing a backdrop for mystery, romance, intrigue, and suspense in this page-turning novel called Skeeter Hawk from author Sabby Stone. Order your copy today at SabbyStone.com. That's S-A-B-Y, SabbyStone.com. And African History Network show, we deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 910 AM Superstation. 910, the Super Station, the oldest radio station in town since 1922. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Super Station Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Tuesday, February 1st, 2022, and we are live. Um, call the numbers 313 778 7600. 313 778 7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Uh, be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, we just dropped a call. Hold on. As soon as we got back from uh, the break, just a second here. Um, be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and uh, you can register for the online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. We have new classes starting up this weekend. All right, we're back. All right, welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation Future Radio. Uh, be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the uh, online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Class number one of ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, starts up uh, Saturday, February 5th, 2022, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a 10-week online class. And there's bonus uh, lectures that you get from me as well as soon as you register and this bonus content you start watching. All right. And if you want me to do a presentation for your group organization, uh, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com as well. All right. Uh, I want to get back to uh, this topic here dealing with the um, attacks on African-American History Month. Now, um, let's go to, I, I just sent you a clip, uh, Shakita, on uh, what is critical race theory from CNN. Uh, and you're going to hear K Kimberly Crenshaw, who's one of the architects of cr critical race theory. Let's go to that clip I just uh, sent you. What is critical race, what, what critical race theory is really about? Uh, this is uh, CNN's Jason Carroll speaking with uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. And critical race theory is a legal analysis um, that developed in the late 1960s, okay, uh, coming out of the civil rights movement. All right, uh, just, just let me know when we had the clip ready. Okay, it, it, let's go back to this other piece here um, from Axios.com. So, 
uh, broadly written laws and proposals allow state you officials. Tell me what critical race theory. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Critical race theory. Critical race theory. No, and I don't know. I can guess. Guessing or not, across the country, a number of politicians are getting it wrong. Critical race theory is a Marxist doctrine that rejects the vision of Martin Luther King Jr. Absolutely false. It's basically teaching kids to hate our country and to hate each other based on race. False and slanderous. Meet professor and scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. Crenshaw is one of the founders of critical race theory, which she helped develop in the late 1980s. In short, critical race theory is an approach based on the idea that the history of white supremacy still has a very real and lasting impact on our society and institutions today. Critical race theory just says, let's pay attention to what has happened in this country and how what has happened in this country is continuing to create differential outcomes so we can become that country that we say we are. So critical race theory is not anti-patriotic. In fact, it is more patriotic than those who are opposed to it because we believe in the 13th and the 14th and the 15th Amendment. We believe in the promises of equality, and we know we can't get there if we can't confront and talk honestly about inequality. Critical race theory is not a doctrine. It's not a manuscript. One way of describing it is looking with a critical eye at race and institutions. Let's take an example from history. The Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal. A critical race theorist would note that slavery persisted for almost 100 years after those words were written, and it was more than a century before women got the right to vote. So why is the term causing such a stir in conservative political circles today? This left-wing nonsense that suggests that any race is inherently inferior or racist or oppressive. Opponents are concerned critical race theory is or will be forced on students. Supporters say that critical race theory is not based on the view of this race is good, this race is bad. Supporters also say in the wake of protests and calls for racial equality in the past year, those unnerved by it are now using critical race theory as a catch-all term for everything related to race, politics, and education in this country. So says Princeton professor Imani Perry. I think this is the sort of post-Trump era um, uh, way of inciting anxiety, fear, and actually trying to sort of elicit a, a, a hostility towards the progress that I think we've begun to make in the, just the last couple of months. To date, at least eight states have taken steps to ban topics surrounding critical race theory without naming it, including Oklahoma. We cannot revert to 100-year-old thinking that a person is any less valuable or inherently racist by the color of their skin. To be clear, critical race theory does not say someone is racist because of the color of their skin. And it does not say anyone should be ashamed of themselves because of the color of their skin. Still, some parents who hear the term are speaking out at school board meetings. Just because I do not want critical race theory taught to my children in school does not mean that I'm a racist, damn it. But Crenshaw says the theory is not about calling individuals racist, but looking at racism still ingrained in American institutions. And she says we have to talk about it. If the censoring of all conversation about racism is called racism, that's what this move is really about. It's really not about a theory. It's really not about what's in people's hearts. It's about an effort to shut down all conversation about the sources and the reproduction of racial inequality. Jason Carroll, CNN, New York. All right. Great reporting from Jason Carroll for, for, uh, for CNN. Everybody also check out this piece here from CNN as well. Cause see, we deal with this stuff like 365, not just during February. Um, what critical race theory is and isn't uh, by Faith uh, uh, Karami. Uh, Monday, May 10th, 2021. And they interviewed uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who you just heard in, in the uh, segment there. Uh, critical race theory is a practice. It's an approach to grappling with a history of white supremacy that rejects the belief 
that what's in the past is in the past and that the laws and systems that grow from that past are detached from it, said Kimberly Crenshaw, a founding critical race theorist and a law professor who teaches at UCLA and Columbia University. Okay, now, uh, okay, we were coming up on the break. Yeah, let me let me go back to this piece here from uh, Axios very quickly. And then um, when we come back from the break, Shakita, I'm going to go to clip number one. So those law, so uh, broadly written laws and proposals allow state officials to punish schools and educators for discussing racism and the history of people of color, critics say. Now, those limits would allow teachers to mention that Brooklyn Dodgers infielder Jackie Robinson broke the major broke Major League Baseball's color barrier, but they would not allow them to discuss why black players were banned before Jackie Robinson. Sharif L. Mekki, founder and CEO of the Center for Black Education, Black Educator Development, said teachers may also introduce Malcolm X but not read his speeches, mention soul singer Marvin Gaye, but not discuss his what's going on lyrics or point out Rosewood, Florida, uh, Rosewood, Florida massacre, 1923, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. They can point them out on, on maps, but not talk about the racial atrocities that occurred there. We'll continue this on the other side of the break and attack on African-American history, black history and black history month. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. All right. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. OK, I want to go back. Uh, I want to go to uh, clip number one here. This is from Deadline White House. They talked about the attack on African-American History Month uh, today. Let's go to clip number one, Shakita. All right, we'll get uh, we'll get that queued up. OK. Also, this is a uh, another uh, article. So this is a big one uh, from NBC News that came out, uh, came out today. Uh, banned books on race and sexuality, banned books on race and sexuality are disappearing from Texas schools in record numbers facing pressure from parents and threats of criminal charges 
Some districts have ignored policies meant to prevent censorship. Librarians and students are pushing back. Librarians and students are pushing back. Okay, do we have clip number one queued up? All right, just press play when, the, when this. On heightened alert from Delaware to Florida to Louisiana, hours with campuses locked down, orders to shelter in place because of more than a dozen bomb threats. Okay, that's, 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 that's the HBCU. Really OPCs are being should, targeted. Clip, clip one should be, clip one should be GOP wars with books and critical race theory in schools from Deadline White House. Black History Month is supposed to be, is for most of us, primarily a celebration, a collective opportunity to pause, to recognize, to rejoice in invaluable contributions made by pioneering Black Americans, sometimes despite extraordinary hurdles over the past century. Harriet Tubman, James Baldwin, Richard Allen, Maya Angelou, Ruby Bridges, Nipsey Hussle, and hundreds of thousands more. The month of February offers at a minimum, an annual opportunity to stop and learn about some amazing human beings who accomplished so much, as we said, under the most dire, difficult, and at times inhumane circumstances in a lot of instances. This year's different. Everything's different, right? This Black History Month, there is a concerted effort nationwide to erase that final context, to intentionally ignore those challenges, the sometimes harsh circumstances through which they persevered, some of what makes them so extraordinary. What conservatives call a war with critical race theory is, in practice, really just an effort to avoid teaching students the uglier part of that, the uglier aspects of our national identity. An Education Week analysis found this, quote, since January 2021, 36 states have introduced bills or taken other steps that would restrict teaching critical race theory or limit how teachers can discuss racism and sexism. 14 states have imposed these bans and restrictions either through legislation or other avenues. Those restrictions manifesting in a nearly unprecedented nationwide crusade to, from that point, new data today, courtesy of NBC News, looking just at Texas, reveals this, quote, Records request to nearly 100 school districts in the Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin regions, a small sampling of that state's 1,250 public school systems, revealed 75 formal requests by parents or community members to ban books from libraries during the first four months in the school year. In comparison, only one library book challenge was filed at those districts during the same time period one year ago, records show. A handful of the districts reported more challenges this year than in the past two decades combined. Let's bring in MSNBC legal analyst Maya Wiley, a former assistant U.S. attorney and civil rights lawyer, and Basil Smichel, Democratic strategist and director of the public policy program at Hunter College. So this is a political movement that has now swept into the classroom. And I wonder, I wonder, Maya, what we do about it. You know, well, I have lots of thoughts about what we do about it, uh, including get organized. Because as we know, uh, it's Black History Month. Um, the, frankly, Black History Month has been under attack for a while. And the 1619 Project of the New York Times that is intended to create uh, both more understanding and education and more of a dialogue on the history from Black slavery through the Black experience and the continued issues of why we have disparities in communities of color and Black communities, that all of that uh, was also helping to galvanize a politically organized attack against this very conversation that's central to democracy, which is understanding our history, understanding how we're all experiencing our country and our communities, and how we actually solve the problems we have to solve. But we only do that when we are able to cross the boundaries of segregated community, when we're able to cross the boundaries of race, when we're able to cross the boundaries of ideology, to have these discussions in a frank, factual way that also focuses on the problems we need to solve. And that doesn't happen when you have uh, historically black colleges and universities getting bomb threats, which we've also seen, uh, that, that this 
this attack on quote unquote critical race theory, which as you point out is a, an attack on black history, is fundamentally about how we educate ourselves so we can be full citizens. And that means making sure books are accessible. Uh, one of the things in that N NBC story that was so important is for a young woman who was in the closet and a lesbian uh, going to the library to find books that helped her work through her own issues of identity and experience and sexuality. And there have to be safe spaces like that for kids uh, across the country, but also in a context where they have someone to talk to and some dialogue. And we're, we're forcing this conversation because there also has to be some lawsuits against any laws that are book banning. Uh, and there has to be a defense fund for any teachers or librarians who are frankly may, you know, as we're seeing in some of these state conversations, face possibly criminal charges, which would be obscene and an abuse of our constitutional order, but we have to be prepared for all of that because that's the country we're in right now, a deeply divided one. I, I want to put two just things that defy logic out there. If you took every human who's trying to ban books and monitored how closely they monitor their kids' screen time, I'm sure there's stuff sneaking through that no librarian would ever in a million years let them see. So the audacity of the mind control of a kid is that it's, it's unachievable. And, and I'm sure there are some parents better than me whose kids don't have iPads, and, and to them, God bless. But you cannot control everything a child consumes. So, so the banning book movement seems wholly political. Basil, and, and I. All right. Uh, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. We're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, uh, WFDF. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the online classes that I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Also, you can support us, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. We're going to keep going for a few more minutes. Right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Monitored how closely they monitor their kids' screen time. I'm sure there's stuff sneaking through that no librarian would ever in a million years let them see. So the audacity of the mind control of a kid is that it's, it's unachievable. And, and I'm sure there are some parents better than me whose kids don't have iPads. And, and to them, God bless. But you cannot control everything a child consumes. So, so the banning book movement seems wholly political, Basil. And, and I, for people that don't have kids in school, I want to explain how it happens and how it manifests. This is an axios. New rules limiting how teachers can teach Black History Month. The limits would allow teachers to mention that Brooklyn Dodgers infielder Jackie Robinson broke Major League Baseball's color line, but not allow them to discuss why Black players were banned before him. Sharif al Maki, founder and CEO of the Center for Black Educator Development, said teachers may also introduce Malcolm X, but not read his speeches. They can mention Marvin Gaye, but not discuss what's going on, what the lyrics are, or point out Rosewood, Florida, or Tulsa, Oklahoma on maps, talk about the racial atrocities that occurred there. Um, <laughs> I, I, if you've ever read about Jackie Robinson with a kid, the first thing they want to understand are the, the Negro Leagues. And, and the only way you can understand that there's progress, that we're going in the right direction in, in, in some of these spaces, is to teach the history. I, I am confounded as to what the end game is here, Basil. Yeah, it, it, well, these are proxy wars, right? It's, these are the small steps that are part of a larger uh, war against a certain against inclusion, um, inclusivity, and it's important to zoom out here because schools have have historically been centers of cultural, political, moral uh, reproduction. Uh, what that means is that throughout our entire history, from before and since public schools have uh, been organized in this country, they've been used for this the purpose of nation building. They've been used for the purpose of creating a narrative about the country and the people that are in it. So that when you have some white Americans who will say, 
you know, we don't want to teach this kind of history. We don't want uh, these kinds of books. What they're doing is trying to preserve the homogeneity of their narrative. And that has, you know, th th of course, that is completely problematic. Uh, and even more so, it, it may be criminal, I you know, hopefully that it, it is in certain instances, but also it does not reflect what the American ideal is supposed to be. But we clearly know how, you know, that how, how much goes on here that we that doesn't reflect that ideology. Um, and so the, the concern is, and Maya is absolutely right, that organizing is really critical here because there are over 14,000 school districts in this country. And so the ability to have a sort of national uh, fight and pushback against this becomes really difficult. You have some areas that are mayoral controlled. There are other areas that have elected school boards. And so in all of these different districts, we have to find a way to organize to push all of this back. But sadly, as my friend Dr. Robert Harvey, who writes about abolitionist teaching and learning, talks about, you have so many teachers engaged in what they call the hush harbor, which is a term that dates back to slavery. Uh, when you have teachers that are outside of their classrooms in environments where they can have conversations away from uh, principals and other authority figures to figure out how they're going to circumvent all of these uh, all of these bands to be able to get the information to their kids uh, in, the, in the way that they feel that they should. We're asking teachers to do so much more than they should just to be able to teach American history. Um, and that's what's so that's what's so sad and so galling uh, about about these bands and about this conversation. But it's a fight that has to be fought at so many levels of government at across the country at the same time. OK, so that was. Um... Basil, uh, Basil Michaels and um, uh, Basil Smichael and uh, Maya Wiley on Deadline White House with Nicole Wallace from today, February 1st. Uh, name of that uh, segment, GOP Wars with Books and Critical Race Theory in Schools. That's at MSNBC.com from uh, Deadline White House. Okay, now there is a um, there's an article we'll, we'll, probably, we'll talk about this some more this week as well because there's so much information on this and this show is only one hour or a little more than one hour um, there, there's a okay NBC News has this one uh, article that deals with 50 books Texas parents want banned from school libraries uh, this is from February 1st, 2022. And let me pull this up here. We may talk, we'll probably talk about this later in the week. Because uh, this is other content dealing with this topic that I want to get to, but I don't have time today to do it. I have two other stories to get to. Um, but read this one here. We'll talk about this tomorrow, most likely. Here are 50 books Texas parents want banned from school libraries. Records requests uncovered dozens of attempts to remove library books from schools, nearly all related to titles dealing with racism, gender, or sexuality. Nearly all related, nearly all the books that some Texas parents want removed are dealing with racism, gender, or sexuality. Uh, conservative parents have swarmed school board meetings in Texas and across the country in recent months to call for the removal of library books that deal with race, racism, sex, gender, and sexuality. Some parents have taken it a step further, filling out paperwork to formally challenge the appropriateness of library books and forcing school administrators to review them. Uh, now, we've been talking about this here for months uh, on this show. NBC News sent public records requests to nearly 100 school districts in the Houston, Texas, Dallas, Texas, San Antonio, and Austin, Texas regions. A small sampling of the state's 1,250 public school systems, okay, in the state of Texas, there are 1,250 public school systems in the state of Texas. And they found 
uh, 86 formal requests to remove books from libraries in 2021. The vast majority of the requests coming during the final four months of 2021, several titles were targeted in multiple school districts. Several titles were targeted in multiple school districts. Drawing from those records, below is a list of 50, 50 books that Texas parents tried to ban in 2021. Okay, so you can go through and 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 look at these. Um, when Wilma Rudolph played basketball, this is about Wilma Rudolph, the uh, uh, the Olympian Wilma Rudolph. A parent in Prosper, which is a Dallas suburb, said this illustrated children's book, which touches on the racism that Olympian Wilma Rudolph, who's African American, African American female that she experienced growing up in Tex in Tennessee in the 1940s should be removed from school libraries because, quote, it opines prejudice based on race, end quote. It opines prejudice based on race, end quote. Um, I've, got a, I've got a ton of information on this, but we'll, we'll deal with this later on in the week. Um, let me see here. The bluest eye, Toni Morrison. Okay, now this is this whole critical race theory, anti-critical race theory uh, laws and other stuff. This is going to be a lightning rod in the 2022 midterm elections that Republicans are going to push because they don't have any policies that are really beneficial to average Americans, especially African Americans. The classic novel by the Nobel Prize winning author Toni Morrison should be banned from schools, according to a parent in the Fort Worth suburb of Birdville because it includes a graphic description of rape. It includes a graphic description of rape. Um, then we've got, uh, okay, Ghost Boys, let's see here. Uh, okay, Ghost Boys by Jewel Parker Rhodes. Now, according to a Houston parent, Reading this novel about a black boy killed by police might cause white children who attend the Spring Branch Independent School District to, quote, feel ashamed based on color of their skin, feel ashamed based on color of their skin. Uh, let me see here. This couple more white bird and wonder. Ground Zero, a novel of 9-11. Uh, tragic. We'll look at a couple more here. Okay. This one summer. What an answer. Breakaways. Oh, listen right here. Michelle Obama, political icon by Heather E. Schwartz. A Caddy, um, Texas, Caddy, Texas, Caddy Independent School District in Texas asked to have the children's biography of former first lady Michelle Obama banned at every grade level because the parents said that this book unfairly depicts former President Donald Trump as a bully and because Michelle Obama's reflections on race gave the impression that, quote, if you sound like a white girl, you should be ashamed of yourself. If you sound like a white girl, you should be ashamed of yourself. Stamped, stamped racism anti-racism and you jason reynolds and ibram x kendi this young adult adaptation of stamped from stamped from the beginning ibram x kendi's national book award winning historical examination of racism 
was flagged for removal by a parent in the Cabby Independent School District in Texas who wrote that the children's book, quote, is littered with completely fabricated and conspiracy theory views on history and that it makes it seem as if all historical events of the past were, were a result of racism. Now, we talked about this book here, Jerry Craft, and we talked about the attempt to get this book. Oh, actually, get Jerry Craft was supposed to speak virtually to a group of students in Texas, and his uh, speech was canceled. His One of his books is called New Kid by Jerry Craft. He's an African-American author, African-American children's author, won all types of awards, things like this. A caddy mom, caddy independent school district, asked to ban this graphic novel about a black seventh grader at a mostly white school because um, uh, this book, this book is like based upon uh, Jerry Craft's experience going to like a predominantly white school, being an African-American male student at a predominantly white school. This crazy ass uh, uh, parent claimed that because it includes references to microaggressions, the book is, quote, about critical race theory, which is forbidden by Texas law, end quote. So, so Jerry Kraft is like writing about his life experiences uh, of being the new kid at a predominantly white school, okay? So this parent wants the book banned. Now, he, he, his, his virtual speech already got, was already canceled. We dealt with that here on this show. It was already canceled because some parents started complaining uh, 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 about the subject matter of his books. But this one parent wants his book banned because they said the book is about critical race theory, which it is not. And, and, and they said that his book includes references to microaggressions and, and critical race theory is, is forbidden by Texas state law. Now, this other book by Jerry Craft called Class Act, Class Act. When school gets real, you still show the world you are a class act. Okay. This is another book by Jerry Craft. He writes children's books. A caddy independent school district mom said this graphic novel, a uh, class act, the second in a series of books by Jerry Craft should be removed from schools because it will make white children, it will make white children feel guilty and Quote, kids will be brainwashed that one race is superior than the other, end quote. Now, I still, I'm still waiting to see a poll of white children who said any of these books made them feel guilty. I'm still waiting on the poll. Where, where they, I'm, I haven't heard one white child say that these books make them feel guilty or something like this. Now, it may, it can make them feel sad about what happened, just like, if you learn about the Holocaust, just to, just just say for existence, you learn about the like when I was a child, when, when I was in high school, we read the diary of Anne Frank. OK, so the diary of Anne Frank, you know, it's about uh, a Jewish girl who's who's being hidden, her and her family and, and, and some other families. They're being hidden from the Nazis. And then they're sold out. And there is an article that just came out from Washington Post that talks about who they think sold them out okay they, they, and they're sold out but um uh, uh, and Anne Frank was killed the father survived her father survived but Anne Frank was killed so the 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 story um the whole understanding of the Holocaust things like this right it'll make it, it uh it's not happy but it's not gonna make us feel you know necessarily feel guilty things like this it's a story that needs to be told just like the history of african americans in this country the history of slavery things like this you don't teach the history to try to make people feel guilty or blame people things like this you teach the history to learn from successes learn from failures make sure these atrocities don't happen again So this 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 mother said 
and I use that term loosely. She said, this book, this children's book, Class Act by Jerry Craft, will make white children feel guilty and, quote, kids will brainwash that one race is superior than the other, end quote. I think a lot of these parents are feeling guilty because of maybe some things that they've done in their past or they're afraid that their children are going to learn, you know, like, uh, uh, okay, some schools don't want to, to, to teach about certain aspects of Ruby Bridges. Okay, I think maybe they're afraid that the children are going to find out that their grandparents were throwing rocks at Ruby Bridges and calling her all types of names, things like that. They don't want them to know about this. So I think there's some projecting going on here. Um, okay, now I'm a book about not my idea, a book about whiteness. Anastasia Higginbotham. A parent asked uh, the Eanes Independent School District in Austin, Texas, to remove this picture book about racial justice, arguing that no books that promote the Black Lives Matter movement should be available to children. No books that promote the Black Lives Matter movement should be available to children. How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. In asking to ban this nonfiction book about resisting racism, an Eanes, uh, uh, Texas uh, parent, suggested replacing it with copies of the Bible. I thought there was a separation between church and state. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. It replace it with the Bible. Yeah, because there was no slavery in the Bible. A Good Kind of Trouble by Lisa Moore uh, Ramey. Or Ramey, Ramey. And Eanes, uh, in Eanes, this is in Texas, parent asked administrators to get rid of this novel about a 12-year-old girl who gets involved in the Black Lives Matter movement because it might cause a white child to feel, quote-unquote, confusion or distress. I'm still waiting on the white child. I'm with, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what, okay, what poll did they take of white children to determine that they feel confusion or distress or guilt or anything like this? But uh, notice how Notice how with all these complaints, right, is so much concern about how white children feel and there's not attention given to how African-American children feel dealing with subject matter of books or lack of subject matter that's being addressed. OK, no, notice the attention is to the feelings of white children but not the feelings of African-American children, Latino children, Native American children, things like this. Okay, let's look at a couple more and I got to get to these other stories and I got to get, I have a lot of I have commercials to record and I have a lot of work to do and I'm getting ready for a class this weekend also, these two classes I have to teach. Um. Let me see. Beyond Magenta Transgender Teen Speak Out. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Mo mo uh, Monday's Not Coming by Tif Tiffany D. Jackson. I'm not familiar with this book. This novel, which focuses on the unexplained disappearance of a black teen, includes explicit language about sex which was the basis for a Birdville parent's request to have it removed from school libraries. Uh, let's look at one more. Okay. Let's see here. 
Okay, last night. Weird girl and what's his name? Court. Uh... Okay, forty seven by Walter Mosley, African American author Mo Walter Mo Mosley. This novel about a young slave boy who becomes swept up in a struggle for his own liberation is one of dozens of library books that have been flagged for removal in uh, Keller, Texas. All right, so check, check this list out here. This is a list of uh, 50 books that Texas parents want banned from school libraries. This is from NBC News, February 1st, 2022. All right, now I want to get to, uh, let's go quickly here. Um, HBCUs got, bomb, the 13 HBCUs got bomb threats today. What a way to start out, start off Black History Month. 13 HBCUs got bomb threats. Um, and as far as I know, you know, nobody was hurt. Uh, we know this is the second day in a row that bomb threats have happened. There were at least six HBCUs on Monday that received bomb threats. Um, I want to go to this piece here from, uh, which one is this? This is uh, NBC News. And then also we have an article from CNN as well. Let me pull these up. There's a clip from NBC Nightly News I want to go to here also. So I need to queue this up. We're not on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF anymore. So I don't have Shakita here to operate the boards for me. So I have to do all this myself. I was watching the Rachel Maddow show today on MSNBC. And, she's, and uh, she interviewed uh, Representative Alma Adams uh, from the Congressional Black Caucus, who has championed HBCUs. And uh, she also interviewed one of the presidents of uh, HBCU. And they're saying that whoever is behind and it's, it, it, it's could def, it could definitely be multiple people behind. It doesn't have to be just one person making these bomb threats. It could be multiple people, but they should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. More than 12 HBCU campuses targeted in new round of bomb threats. Howard University in Washington, D.C., was among several historically black colleges and universities to receive threats on Monday. Um, and and uh, also we see it continued on Tuesday, okay? Howard University in Washington, D.C. was among several historically black colleges and universities to receive threats on Monday, but we saw this continue on Tuesday as well. The first day of African American History Month. Howard University was among the first to issue a shelter in place order early Tuesday just a day after the school and several other HBCUs received similar threats. Um, Howard University said in a statement, oh, in an alert, um, a bomb threat against the university is being investigated. All persons on campus are advised to shelter, all, uh, all persons on campus are advised to shelter uh, shelter in all persons on campus are advised to shelter in place until more information is available. The emergency alert was time stamped at 3:29 a.m. Tuesday morning, the first day of Black History Month. An all clear was later issued for Howard University following a probe. The university did not immediately respond to a request for comment from NBC News. Now, in addition to Howard University, um, the University of the District of Columbia, also in Washington, D.C., Morgan State University, Coppin State University in Baltimore, Fort Valley State, um, um, Fort, Fort, Fort Valley State University uh, in Fort Valley, Georgia, Kentucky State University. Uh, Xavier in Louisiana, 
Edward, Edward Waters University in Jacksonville, Florida, Alcorn uh, State University in Mississippi, Mississippi Valley State University, uh, Rust College in Holly Springs, uh, Mississippi, Spelman College in Atlanta, Jackson State University in Mississippi, and Tugelo uh, College in Tugelo, Mississippi, all reported bomb threats according to school officials and social media posts. So there were 13 um, HBCUs that received bomb threats today. Now I want to go to, let me uh, cue this up here just a second. I want to go to this update. All right, so we'll let that queue up. Now, like Howard, Kentucky State, um, Jackson State, the University of the District of Columbia, Tugelo, and Coppin State issued all clear alerts after finding the threats to be unsubstantiated soon after reporting the, the threats. But this still causes stress for the students and faculty, things like this, and parents, and parents. Additional threats were reported at a number of other colleges and universities. NBC News has not yet confirmed those reports. Now, Morgan State University President David K. Wilson said in a statement to uh, community members that he was saddened to confirm that the school had received a bomb threat after being asked by several, several people whether this is real. Unfortunately, and sadly it is, he said, the campus is being searched building by building this morning without, with our residential halls being searched first, with our residential halls being searched first. All right, let me see if we can cue this up here. All right, so check out this uh, piece here. More than 12 HBCU campuses targeted in new round of bomb threats. And I want to cue this clip up. Um, also, there's a piece from CNN as well. I'm just tired of being terrorized like my grandparents were. Okay, stand by. Let's cue this up here. Many of the nation's historically black colleges and universities on heightened alert from Delaware to Florida to Louisiana. Hours with campuses locked down, orders to shelter in place because of more than a dozen bomb threats. Sad that it's really only HBCUs that are being targeted. At Howard University, bomb threats two days in a row, the third threat since January 5th. You take these threats seriously? Absolutely. Like many at these institutions, Dr. Toshni Ann Dubroy thinks the fact that it's the start of Black History Month is likely no coincidence. A month that usually celebrates the innovation of our community and uh, celebrates the valor of black people has now been tainted because we have such a significant threat against our HBCU community. At the White House, aides say the president is getting regular updates. It is scary, it is horrifying, it is um, terrible that these students, these faculty, these institutions are feeling under threat. The FBI is saying they're working with our law enforcement partners to address any potential threats. Now students like Ashley Fields are back in class with a lot of questions. We've not received any word about whether the two have been connected or, you know, where the threat has come from. It's not the ideal environment for students trying to learn. On Howard's campus now, a much bigger police presence, including help from the D.C. Metro Police, not usually stationed here. So far, authorities have not reported finding any explosive devices on any campus. All right. That was uh, Ron Allen for uh, NBC News. OK, CNN has this piece here. Uh, I'm just tired of being terrorized, terrorized like my grandparents were. 
more than a dozen HBCUs got bomb threats on the first day of Black History Month. This is uh, from CNN, February 1st, uh, 2022. So they list the colleges. Uh, at least 14 HBCUs reported bomb threats Tuesday. At least one of them, Howard University, also received a bomb threat Monday. Okay, so we have at least 14. Um, I think this was an update from the um, NBC News story. So we have at least 14 HBCUs um, that received bomb threats on Tuesday. All right, so check that out from CNN as well. Okay, now... I want to get to this last story here. There's a lot more information I have, but we don't have time to deal with it. We have to deal with this tomorrow. Um, it was, I think, Friday before last when I was on uh, Roller Martin Unfiltered. We talked to Darnell Crossland, who is the attorney uh, for the Lauren Smith Fields family. And he's also been uh, retained by the family of Brenda Rawls. And um, we talked about, let's see, last, okay, last Friday, we talked about Brenda Rawls on uh, Roller Martin and Filter. I think Donnell Crossland was on. I can't remember. I can't remember. But we talked about Brenda Rawls. She, um, when I was on this past Friday, so Brenda Rawls is an African-American woman who was killed the same day, December 12th, that Lauren Smith Fields was killed. And the family of Brenda Rawls says they were being treated very disrespectfully by the Bridgeport uh, Connecticut Police Department. New York Times has this, this is a big article from um, January 31st, updated February 1st. Second black family says Bridgeport uh, police notified them of death, so, did not notify them of death. Second black family says Bridgeport police did not notify them of death. Two officers were suspended over their handling of the cases of Lauren Smith Fields and Brenda Lee Rawls, who died in Bridgeport, Connecticut on the same day. Okay, now there's no, no one saying that their their deaths were related. Okay, but the, the families uh, were are saying they were both mistreated by the Bridge, Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut Police Department. Now, I want to go to, uh, this is clip number three. This is from Roland Martin Unfiltered. So on January 31st, 2022, Roland spoke again with Darnell Crossland, who is the family attorney for both of these families. And Darnell Crossland gave an update on um, the two uh, investigations. Okay, let's get past these ads here. We'll go to that. Now, let's see here. All right. So they heard from a neighbor that their sister, Brenda Lee Rawls, had died. They heard from a neighbor that their sister, Brenda Lee Rawls, had died, but they could not find her body. They went to uh, Miss Rawls' home in Bridgeport, Connecticut. They called the police department. They called area hospitals. They called local funeral homes. They finally found her body at the medical examiner's office on December 14th, two days after she was pronounced dead. Quote, we had to do our own investigation, said Dorothy Washington, Brenda Rawls' sister. The police never notified us of her death. The police never notified us of her death. The family later in the week learned that a detective, Angel Lanos, who had been assigned to Brenda Rawls' case, um, they had been assigned to Brenda Rawls' case. They left him at least four messages, uh, said Miss Washington, but he never returned them. Detective Lanos is one of two Bridgeport police detectives who were suspended and, and put on administrative leave late Sunday 
Okay, so that was uh, late Sunday, January 30th. I'm sorry, late Sunday, yeah, January 30th. Because of their handling of the deaths of Lawrence Smith Fields and Brenda Rawls, who both died on the same day, December 12th, 2021. Brenda Rawls was 53 years old. Lawrence Smith Fields was 23 years old. Um, I want to go to this uh, uh, interview that Roland did with uh, another interview Roland did with attorney uh, Darnell Crossland, who is representing uh, both families. Let's see here. Let's uh, back that up. Let's see. We start at the 705 mark. All right. Stand by. Joe uh, Garen, address the standby. St okay, here we go. Detectives and <sighs> folks, Bridgeport, Connecticut mayor is ordered two of the detectives involved in the Lawrence Smith Fields and Brenda Lee Rawls deaths uh, to be placed on administrative leave. In a two minute video, Mayor Joe uh, Garen addressed the crisis, addressed the cases, folks, and the neglect of Bridgeport police. Once again, I want to express my condolences to the families of Lawrence Smithfields and also the family of Brenda Lee Rawls. After reviewing these matters even more closely, I've now directed Deputy Chief Baraja of the Bridgeport Police Department to immediately put on leave the two officers who are the subject of the Bridgeport Internal Affairs investigation and disciplinary action for their lack of sensitivity to the public and their failure to follow police procedure in the handling of these two matters. Let me be clear. Effective immediately, both Detective Lyons and Detective Cronin are suspended from duties and put on administrative leave from the Bridgeport Police Department until such time as the OIA investigation and disciplinary cases have been completed regarding Lawrence Smithfields and Brenda, Lee's, Brenda Lee Rawls' cases. The Bridgeport Police Department has high standards for officer sensitivity, especially in matters involving the death of a family member. It is an unaccepted failure if policies were not followed. To the families, friends, and all who care about human decency, that that should be shown in these situations, in this case by members of the police department, I'm very sorry. In addition, the officer who was in charge of always seeing these matters has retired from the department as of this past Friday. To again, make it clear, both to members of the public and to the department, insensitivity, disrespect in action, or deviation from policy will not be tolerated by me or others in this administration. My disappointment and demand for accountability in these and all other matters brought to my attention will remain until all the questions are answered to the satisfaction of all. It should also be noted that the untimely death of Lawrence Smithfields and Brenda Lee Rawls are both still under active investigation and have been reassigned to members of the Bridgeport Police Department to resolve. I want to thank Attorney Crossland and the family and the thousands of others for reaching out and asking the questions that needed to be asked and that still need answers. I as mayor, but also as a father, cannot fully comprehend what must be going through. I can only pledge my continued support to try and ease your pain by getting answers and holding those responsible accountable. Darnell Crossland, he is the uh, Smithfields family attorney who joins us right now from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Darnell, glad to have you back. So. One of the cops just mysteriously retires. Yes. Um, you know, I'm looking at your 1906. I'm reminded of the seven jewels. I'm glad to see that you wearing that shirt. Um, so uh, what, what, we, what we've been learning here is that this department is in shambles. And uh, we've been saying that from day one. So it's either a combination of incompetence, um, disorganization, or straight out racism. But did both of these families didn't get the treatment that they should have gotten when their loved ones died. And my office has since been retained to handle the Brenda Lee Rawls family case as well. And the mayor said just now that he wants to thank me and a thousand others for asking the questions that needed to be asked.
but still have not been answered. Well, that's exactly what we're looking for now is answers. So we're glad that they've taken the step in the right direction um, to at least acknowledge liability and responsibility for the inaction of these police officers. But now we want answers and we want some action. So obviously, let's just be clear, pressure made all of this possible. This was not uh, the decision of Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, an independent decision. It was the pressure. It was from you, from activists, from the family, from the media that forced the mayor's hand to take this action. Absolutely. Well, what I've been saying, and I've made a public statement, uh, which is quite clear. Listen, the world and people around the country have responded to our cries for justice. They heard us from as far as Hawaii. And yet still, a month and a half later, we're just hearing from the mayor's office. So my question was simple. If they can hear us from Hawaii, what took you so long to hear us? And so we are saying today that uh, we should have been heard from day one. And I'm not sure if it's political or what it is, but we're glad that we're finally being heard. But when the cameras uh, go off, we still need to have things happening. So we're going to hold this mayor accountable and this administration accountable. And we announced today that the only way that you can hold these people accountable is as uh, Billy Murphy uh, once said to me, who did the Freddie Gray case in Baltimore, is that you gotta let them pay. And we've announced that we're gonna be filing a $30 million lawsuit asking for punitive damages, also policy change. But we must let them pay. They have insurances that um, these cities are bounded, bonded by, and these insurance companies are gonna get tired of paying out these claims and they're going to demand that there's more accountability so that they don't have to pay. The, uh, one of the, last week, the president pro tem of the city council was on our show, and he said that the council was going to write a letter asking the state to take over the investigation. Has that happened? Uh, no. I, actually, I watched that show of yours, and I know you, you kind of try to hammer this gentleman down to see, uh, is it something that he's just thinking about, or is they going to put a bill before the city council, or what's the procedure? And uh, Maria Pereira, who's a city councilwoman for the district that both these women were found dead in, um, she hasn't said anything about that procedure. So I'm not sure uh, how he's going about that, but it has not happened yet. That was interesting because he said that was supposed to have been done by Thursday. It didn't happen. Um, so the only thing that has happened since then, and I'll be glad to share with you, is that I sent a letter objecting to the ME's report. The, there was a cause of death and a manner. Cause is the toxins that were found inside of Lawrence Smith Fields. And we are shocked that they have fentanyl and antihistamines found in her. Um, because obviously we know antihistamines put you to sleep and make you um, uh, unfocused. So it's, it appears that that's a primary date rape drug. The manner could, the, the, the ME's office told me it could be choking, um, homicide, manslaughter, accident. So my question to them is how did you deemed as an accident in total disregard for the facts and the evidence that's here that she was with a, some another gentleman right before she died, drinking and possibly drugged. So we're objecting to that because that's another way to just disregard black women and say it was just an accident, nothing to see here, folks. Go about your business. And we're not going to go about our business and, and walk away from this. Uh, has the family done their own um, independent autopsy? And if so, when are those results going to be released? So the, uh, the, the father um, of Lawrence Smith Fields uh, commissioned a gentleman who uh, works at the Stanford Hospital here and also does that type of autopsy. Um, and as far as I know, that the autopsy is not completed. And uh, also the father told me last week that there was some uh, funds that were being demanded in order for them to release what they've had so far. So thankfully, we have a GoFundMe, and, um, and I'm going to be speaking with the family to clear the necessary funds. So... We have no holdups, so we so our own pathologists can give us their their um their findings. All right, then, and of course, uh, just give out that GoFund information again for folks uh, uh, who like to contribute. Yeah, so please contribute. If you go into Lawrence Smith Fields on the GoFundMe, it comes right up. And uh, again, Lawrence Smith Fields on GoFundMe, and please help us support us with uh, investigators as well as pathologists to find the truth and what happened here on this journey to justice. All right, Darnell Crossland, we surely appreciate it. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Okay, so that is from uh, Roland Martin, unfiltered January 31st, 2022, Monday. 
um you know we've been talking about this story here i got a chance to uh we, and when i was on uh roland martin unfiltered last friday and the friday before that friday january 28th and then also friday january 21st we talked about those stories we talked about brenda rawls um on uh friday january 28th and when i was on the show on the 21st i got a chance to speak with attorney crossland as well we shared that uh segment here on this show read this article here from uh new york times from january 31st 2022 by lola fadula uh lola fadula uh she's of african descent and it's updated february 1st second black family says bridgeport police did not notify them of death uh, two officers were suspended over the handling of the cases of Lauren Smith Fields and Brenda Lee Rawls, who died in Bridgeport, Connecticut, on the same day. They died on December 12th, 2021. All right. Um, all right. Hey, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show, do cash app, dollar sign, the AHN show. Through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the EHN show. So we definitely need your support. We're here six days a week. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the home page. I have the information there. Um, you can uh, click on the, uh, we have the Cash App link there now as well. And this is our official Cash App account, dollar sign, the EHN show, S H O W. You go to it, it says Michael, shows my picture there. You can click right here. That's official Cash App uh, account. These other ones are fake African History Network uh, Cash App accounts. And click right here for uh, PayPal. PayPal.me forward slash the EHN show. Now, you can register for the online classes that I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, we have class number one starting up this weekend. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, starts up Sunday, February 6th, class number one, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. It's a 10-week online class. And then also Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Uh, if you have taken these classes, any of these classes in the past, email me, and uh, you're going to get a discount on the on the new class. OK, you get a 50 percent discount on the new class. Um, let me post a link here. The yeah, class number one starts up uh, and then we have a bundle pack. Also, so we have a, a bundle pack. where you can register for both classes for one hundred twenty dollars. Classes are regularly one hundred thirty dollars each. You still have access to the full class even after the class is over with. So a year from now, if you want to go back and watch the entire 10 week course, you can do that. You should have full access. We have a bundle pack here. You can register for both classes for only $120. Now you also get some bonus lectures from me when you register for these classes. So the um, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school, you're going to get the uh, 15 uh, lecture Black History Month bundle pack. The one that we have in uh, DVD format, okay? We have it in DVD format if you want, want to order it from our white in DVD format. 15 of my lectures. This is our Black History Month bundle pack. It also includes a presentation that I've done dealing with the history of African American History Month. But um, you'll get that, uh, you'll get the lectures in digital format when you register for Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. That's a, a free bonus that you get, okay? So, the class is regularly $130 on sale, $80. If you uh, buy it by itself or you can get them in a bundle pack, two classes for uh, $120 for a limited time only. That's a $260 value. We just posted the link here and we also have um, have it at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, African-American business owners, email us at show in AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have a few slots left. You can advertise with us. Current promotion, buy one month, get two months free. Buy one month, get two months free. All right. And um, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Email us at AHN Show at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We take your 30 second and 60 second commercial, put into the rebroadcast of these shows, also into the audio podcast of our shows. We're on 10 different 
audio podcast platforms on um, iHeartRadio and iTunes and Stitcher, CastBox, on a number of different uh, uh, podcast platforms. All right. Hey, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now this correct wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace. Soul in Motion, celebrating 38 years in the arts. This energetic ensemble of dancers and drummers was started by percussionist Michael Friend and is led by choreographer, associate director Pam Lassiter. Based in the Washington, D.C. area, Soul in Motion is now accepting bookings for Black History Month, Juneteenth, and summer festivals in 2022. Soul in Motion is also available for more intimate events like naming ceremonies and weddings. To find out more or book your date, call 240-452-1349 or send an email to info at soulinmotion.org. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Soul in Motion, celebrating our history, our culture, our future. Soul in Motion, theater, African dance, and drumming since 1984. iRedify is a black-owned digital platform that showcases black and brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read e-books, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Come and travel with me to a time long ago and place far away. You will experience high adventure and excitement. You are fighting alongside an ancient army in fierce battle. Feel the exhilaration of struggle and final conquest. 
My name is Manin Kare, and I am both a prince and a priest in one of the most advanced civilizations humans have ever produced. I want you to ride with me in my chariot as I slay the barbarians who have come to invade my land. I invite you to sit at the conference table with the great Pharaoh Taharqa and his ministers as they plan intrigue and use subterfuge to outmaneuver and defeat the enemy. Come back with me to the land of your ancestors, to the beautiful land of Kemet. So open the pages of this book and begin the adventure. Find out what happens in the book Maninkare Battles the Assyrians in the Nile Valley from author Makari Jones. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. Follow the story Skeeter Hawk as attorney Ben Brooks rediscovers his Gullah Geechee heritage and finds romance along the Gullah Trail and the Sea Islands. Jilted by his fiancée who refused to marry him, Ben Brooks goes back home to Gullah country. There, the Gullah people come to call him Skeeter Hawk. While rediscovering his heritage, Skeeter Hawk unravels dark family secrets. A beautiful childhood friend, Fulla, becomes his guide as they travel the Gullah Trail from North Carolina to the Sea Islands in South Carolina in search of more answers. Ben Brooks falls in love with her and becomes torn between her and his former fiance who wants to rekindle their romance. He also deals with a premonition that one of his enemies is pursuing him, providing a backdrop for mystery, romance, intrigue, and suspense in this page-turning novel 